Shalom. A while back, uh, actually a, a few days ago, I recorded a video regarding uh, the importance of hearing correctly. Uh, in that video, I emphasized the importance of hearing the word of Yah correctly. Because if we hear the word of Yah correctly, then we will understand the word of Yah correctly. And then that will in turn generate correct obedience. It's very important that we hear the word of Yah correctly uh, because of uh, generations of, of our fathers and our grandparents hearing the word of Yah incorrectly. And most of it was, was due to no fault of their own. Uh, this was inherited from their fathers. And uh, it was more, oft more often than not uh, forced down the throats uh, of their fathers. And so generation upon generation uh, of the populace has uh, inherited a incorrect understanding of Yah's word. And that incorrect understanding has uh, generated a generation of incorrect obedience. Not only that, but it has e erected uh, uh, countless false theologies. One of the most prevalent theologies that uh, this uh, inability to understand Yah's word correctly has produced is the theology of, but Paul said. The theology of, but Paul said. Interestingly, um, the very people who adhere to the doctrine, uh, doctrine of what Paul said, more often than not, don't understand what Paul is saying. I submit to you that it's, it, it is impossible to understand what Shaul is saying without having a foundation or an understanding in the Torah. Because Paul never veered from the Tudah. He never veered from teaching the Tudah. Uh, his foundation of whatever he taught was founded and rooted and grounded in the Tudah. The issue is uh, we have generations who have been taught the false theology that, uh, or the lie, let's, let's put it bluntly, the lie that we are no longer under Torah and that uh, Torah is now irrelevant and that we don't have to learn Torah uh, and neither do we have to obey Torah. This is an outright lie. Uh, I don't have time to get into that right now. Uh, the purpose of this video uh, is specifically uh, to address um, a couple of uh, misunderstandings that our father Shaul spoke, just a couple. Um, <laughs> there are boundless misunderstandings and mis misinterpretations of what Paul uh, Shaul said, but for the sake of time uh, today, uh, I'm only going to narrow it, narrow it down uh, to a couple, to a couple of different passages that are most often brought up uh, to support the false theology of what Paul said, and to also support the false theology that uh, we don't have to obey uh, Yash Turah anymore. And so with that, um, 
I want to address a couple of different passages. Uh, the first passage will come from Romeim, or Romans, the 14th chapter. And the second uh, passage will come from Colossians, or Colossians, the second chapter. Uh, these are very, very popular passages uh, in the Christian community. Uh, to support lawlessness. Uh, very, very popular passages within the Christian community to support lawlessness. In fact, uh, whenever uh, we, uh, someone who is walking in truth brings up that the Shabbat is eternal, the, the feasts are eternal, uh, these two passages are two of the most popular passages that uh, are brought up in defense of lawless behavior. And so the purpose, again, of this video is, is not to address uh, all of Paul's sayings. Uh, maybe that'll come in subsequent videos. Uh, but the purpose of this video is to tear down the standing stones. Uh, in other words, to tear down the false idols of the misunderstandings and the theology of, but Paul said, but Paul said, uh, with respect to these two passages. Uh, and I chose these two passages, passages again, uh, because these are two of the most popular passages that are used by Christians worldwide uh, to support lawless behavior. So with that said, if you have your scriptures or if you do not have your scriptures, go ahead and pause this video right now and run and get your scriptures and come back and let's read through the scriptures. Let's, let's gain some context. Let's read through them and seek the Ruach HaKadosh for understanding because understanding only comes from him. Hakma only comes from him. Let's seek him and prayerfully gain some understanding with respect to what Paul is actually saying in these two popular passages that are most often used in defense of lawless behavior. So again, the first passage, the first scripture is Roman in Romans, the 14th chapter verse 1 through 6. I'll read through it first, and then I'll point some things out. Verse 1. And receive him who is weak in the belief, not criticizing his thoughts. One indeed believes to eat all food, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. He that eats, let him not despise him who does not eat. And he that does not eat, let him not judge him who eats. Follow him, received him. Who are you that judges another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. But he shall be made to stand, for follow him able to make him stand. One indeed judges one day above another. Another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. He who minds the day, minds it to Yahuwah. And he who does not mind the day, to Yahuwah he does not mind it. He who eats, eats to Yahuwah. For he gives Elohim thanks. And he who does not eat, to Yahuwah, he does not eat and give, gives Elohim thanks. This particular passage is one of the most popular passages to support <clears throat> the lawless behavior that uh, the Shabbat does not matter. And the only thing that matters is that uh, we esteem the day to Yahuwah, irrespective of the fact that Yahuwah has deemed 
the Shabbat eternal. That he has deemed the Shabbat eternal. Now, some translations uh, will say, uh, he who minds the, uh, I think I've read translations where it says a holy day, uh, minds it to Yahuwah. I submit to you that, uh, again, if, if you don't have an understanding of the Torah, then you're going to totally not get this passage. You are going to totally not get this passage. Now, later in this passage, uh, he also addresses foods that are being sacrificed to idols that are being sold in the meat market. Uh, he is not addressing unclean foods. He is not giving you permission to eat that which is unclean. Uh, this is a common thing. He again addresses this to the Corinthians. And nevertheless, I, this video is not about that, but in particular of this uh, verses 1 through 6. Now, if you note, uh, he mentions eating a total of 10 times uh, in verses 1 through 6. He mentions eating 10 times. In verses 1 through 6. And so this passage is not about a Shabbat. Shabbat is not even mentioned in this passage of scripture. The word Shabbat is not mentioned. What is mentioned is eating and not eating. Eating and not eating. He who chooses to eat on a certain day, let him eat. He who chooses not to eat on a certain day, let him not eat. I submit to you that Paul here is addressing fasting. He is addressing fasting. He is speaking to Yahudim, and he is trying to establish order within the community, within the assembly. He is attempting to uh, bring them to the understanding that they should not allow differences between um, fasting and not fasting to drive division amongst them. That if a person chooses to fast, let him fast because that day he is fasting to Elohim. He is fasting to Yahuwah. If a person chooses not to fast, then he is choosing not to fast to Yahuwah then don't judge him for not fasting. Now, here again is where you need to have an understanding in the Tanakh. To understand what he is saying here and what he is addressing, you have to have an understanding in the Tanakh and the Torah. So if you turn with me, I, I have a couple of witnesses. If you turn with me to the book of Zechariah, the seventh chapter, and we'll read verses one through six, and then we'll skip down to Zechariah, verse eight, verses 18 through 19. And we will show here that uh, fasting on certain days uh, was a tradition amongst the Yahudim who Shaul is addressing. It was a tradition. Uh, it was not something new. Uh, but Paul was saying, Shaul was saying, don't let this divide you. This is not something that should divide you. If, if one fasts, then let him fast. If one, if one doesn't fast, then he doesn't fast on a certain day. But this is not something that should divide you. So let's read Zechariah, the seventh chapter, verses one through six, starting at verse one. And in the fourth year of sovereign Darius, it came to be that the word of Yahuwah came to Zechariah on the fourth of the ninth month in Kislu. Now Bethal had sent Sharitha and Regin Melech and his men to pray before Yahuwah. Speaking to the Kohenim who belonged to the house of Yahuwah Shabaoth, 
and to the Nabiin, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? Then the word of Yahuwah of Shabbat came to me, saying, Speak to all the people of the land and to the Kohanim, saying, when you fasted and lamented in the fifth and seventh months, all these 70 years, did you truly fast for me, for me? And when you ate and when you drank, was it not for those eating and for those drinking? Zakiah chapter eight, verses 18 through 19. And the word of Yahuwah of Shabbat came to me saying, thus said Yahuwah of Shabbat the fast of the fourth and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth months are to be samach, what you call joy, and simcha, or gladness, and pleasant appointed times for the house of Yahuda. And they shall love the truth and the shalom. So Shaul isn't addressing something new here. He is addressing, addressing a tradition of the Yahudim. But if you don't have a foundation in the Tanakh, if you don't have a foundation in the Torah, then you're going to misinterpret this as him saying that you can now keep Shabbat on whichever day that you want. Or you can now eat whatever you want. Again, correct hearing generates correct understanding, whereby generating correct obedience, whereby generating the correct kind of fruit. If you don't have a foundation in Torah, if you don't have an understanding of Torah, then you're going to totally, totally miss what our father Shaul is saying and the order that he is trying to establish. It had nothing to do in general with food and it had nothing to do with the Shabbat. Shabbat is not even mentioned. He's dealing with a faction. He's dealing with an argument, with a disagreement, with those who adhere to the tradition of fasting on certain days and those who did not adhere to the, to the tradition of fasting on certain days, who were being judged by the ones who adhered to the tradition of fasting on certain days. Plainly, I don't know how else to, 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 to say it. This is what he's addressing. And this should establish the importance of having a foundation in Torah, a foundation in the Torah. The next passage of scripture I want to address um, comes from Colossians, uh, Colossians, the second chapter, another very, very popular passage of scripture that is most often used by the lawless to support lawless behavior with respect to, I can choose whatever day that I wanna uh, worship Elohim. And, and that's, that's, that's true. We can worship Yahuwah on every single day of the week. But he has ordained from the beginning one day that we are to rest on. And that is the eternal Shabbat, the seventh day. It is the only day ordained by which we are to rest. If you want to worship on any seven days of the week, you are free to worship seven days of the week. But we are ordained to rest are commanded to rest only on the seventh day. And for, you who, and for you who say that the first day or the day you call Sunday, 
the day of the sun. It's not a Shabbat. That's not true. That day was ordained as a Shabbat by the Catholic Church. Catholic meaning universal. So if you call yourself a Christian, then you are part of the universal church of Catholicism. And if you are adhering to the first day of the week, then you are a part of the Catholic Church and you are, in fact, one of her harlot daughters. And you are, in fact, keeping the Shabbat that the Catholic Church has ordained, the day of the sun. There's no way around that. There's no way around that. So I want to I want to address this second passage that is Colossian, the second chapter. Verses 16 to 23. But I want to preface that uh, by reading Exodus, the 31st chapter, uh, verses 13 through 17. That's Shemoth, the 31st chapter, verses 13 through 17. Beginning at verse 13, it reads, And you speak to the children of Yasharal, saying, My Shabbat you are to guard. Shabbats, plural, not Shabbat, singular, but Shabbats, plural. My Shabbats you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart and you shall guard the Shabbat. For it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death. That's an eternal decree. Just because that decree is delayed uh, does not mean that it has been done away with. Make no mistake. The righteous judge, the Zedek judge, Yahusha Hamashiach, at the end of all things will sit on his judgment seat. And he will judge all mankind, all nations, in accordance with his Torah. And all who have transgressed the Torah and have not repented from that transgression will receive the penalties in accordance with the Torah for transgressing the Torah. If the penalty is death, then the penalty is death. If the penalty is you will be cast away from your people, then the penalty is you will be cast outside of your people. But if it calls for death, then the penalty is death. And here it says, for it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death. For anyone who does work on it, that being shall be cut off from among his people. Six days Work is done, and on the seventh is a Shabbat of rest, set apart to Yahuwah. Everyone doing work on the Shabbat day shall certainly be put to death. And the children of Yasharal shall guard the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout their generation as an everlasting covenant. How long is everlasting? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer. But think about it. How long is everlasting? Between me and the children of Yasharal, it is a sign forever. How long is forever? Again, this is another rhetorical question, but how long is forever? For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens, the Shamayim, and the arrests, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So I wanted to read that uh, as a preface uh, to Colossians, the second chapter, verses 16 through 23. Again, a passage, a familiar passage that is most, most often used to support lawless behavior. To support lawless behavior. So beginning at verse 16, uh, I'm going to read from the KJV because a lot of you 
uh, still adhere to the KJV. I don't want to address that. I won't get into um, how the KJV is a Masoretic text and how it is full of pagan language, but we won't get to that. That This video is not about that. Uh, for the sake of, of reaching a larger audience, uh, we'll read from the KJV, beginning at verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day. Now that word, that's very deceptive. If you look at it from the surface, that word is very deceptive because you'll begin to think, well, he's talking about a Shabbat, a Shabbat, particularly a Shabbat. But if you look at the Greek word behind um, holy day, uh, in the Strong's, this Greek, 11859, and we find the word heote, heote. And it means a feast, a festival, periodically reoccurring. Periodically reoccurring. So here he says, let no man therefore judge you and meet or in drink or is or in respect of a festival day that is reoccurring. Now I want you to bookmark again Exodus 31, uh, where Yahuwah has said that the Shabbat are eternal. They are eternal. So if they are eternal, if Yah has decreed, decreed that they are eternal, how can a mere man, Shaul, how can a mere man then come along and change or supersede what Yah has said? I submit to you, he did not. He did not. Let's continue reading. Or of the new moon, or of the Shabbat days. Again, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a festival day or of the new moon or of the Shabbat days. Again, we are charged to study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of Yah. We are charged to study to show ourselves approved. And so if you study the history of the assembly uh, at Kalash, you begin to understand that this assembly was ravished by Gnosticism. It was ravaged by Gnosticism. Shaul never visited Kalash uh, personally. Uh, this was one of his prison letters. Uh, but he heard about the assembly uh, at Kalash from Epaphras. Epaphras. Uh, Epaphras was one whom uh, Shaul described as his beloved co worker. This Epaphras was the one who delivered the Bessera to. Uh, the assembly at Kalash, the Bessera being the message or the good news. When he arrived, he discovered that even the dispersed from the northern kingdom and uh, the Yahudim that were there, to whom he was sent, uh, were enveloped in Gnosticism. Were enveloped in Gnosticism. Uh, but after the Bessera was preached to them, uh, many of them were converted. In this letter to the assembly at Kalash, Shaul is sending encouragement and warnings. In this verse, in this verse, in verse 16, the Gnostics at Kalash had started to judge the assembly because of their keeping of Yah's appointed times and observing his dietary laws and uh, his new moons, etc. 
Likewise, Shaul is admonishing them to not allow any man to judge them because of their obedience. Verse 17 reads, which are a shadow to things to come, shadow of things to come. Now the King James Version says, but the body is of Mashiach, or what you call, you call Christ. But reading this correctly, it would read for the body of Mashiach, or whom you call Christ. So in verse 17, Paul is reminding uh, the assembly that Yah's commandments, appointed times and, and days are eternal. They are forever. And they are a foreshadowing of things to come. In fact, the appointed times, the feast days, are they, Yah's redemption plan is hidden within them. Now, I don't have time to address that right now, but I need you to understand that Yah's redemption plan for his people, for his people, is hidden within his appointed times. Moreover, these appointed times are dress rehearsals. The festivals, the appointed times, the new moons, the Shabbats, they are dress rehearsals for the wedding feast. They are dress rehearsals for the wedding feast. And so he reminds them here that they are a foretaste, a foreshadow of what has been set aside or set apart for the body of the Mashiach, for the assembly of Yahuwah, for Yasharal, for those who guard them with all of their heart, with all of their mind, and with all of their strength. Verse 18, he says, Then let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of messenger of angels, intruding into those things which he have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, verse 18 here, he is clearly addressing Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the worshiping or the worship of spiritual beings. It is the worship of spiritual beings. Gnostics, one of the, the problems that Shaul had with the community uh, at Kalash was that, yes, it was, it was uh, ravished by Gnosticism. But if you know anything about Gnosticism, then you'll begin to understand that Gnostics, Gnostics believe that nothing from the physical or material realm is good or can be good. Only that which comes from the spiritual realm is good. And so they had difficulty accepting Yahushua, the Hamashiach, because he was fully man and fully Elohim. And so they had difficulty accepting him and receiving him because of their Gnostic beliefs and believing that nothing could, nothing good could come from the physical realm. And so here, Shaul is tearing down standing stones. He is tearing down standing stones. He is tearing down the Gnostic doctrine of worshiping angelic beings, our, mess, our, our, our messengers, the worship of messengers. Verse 19. And not holding the head from which all of the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of Elohim. Again, here we go. Uh, because it was a Gnostic community, uh, they didn't believe that anything good could come from the physical realm, that anything good could come from matter. They believe that the only that only that good could only come from the physical realm, from the spiritual realm. 
Thus they rejected the Hamashiach, who was fully Elohim and fully man, because he was born a man. They were unable to understand that he is the cornerstone, that he is the, the stone laid in Zion on which everything is built, on which the whole house, both Aphraim and Yahuda, is built. He is the stone, the chief cornerstone that was rejected, that completes the house, the whole Bayif of Yasharal. And he holds everything together. He holds everything together, and they could not receive this, some of them, could not receive this nor understand this because of their Gnostic, Gnostic beliefs. Verse 20. Wherefore, if you be dead with Mashiach from the rudiments of the world, why, as through living in the world, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? In other words, if you died with Yahusha Hamashiach, and are now seated with him in the places of Shamayim, freed from the elemental ruachs of this world, why would you go on living as though you were still in subjection to them and to the man-made traditions that they control? Verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. See verse 20. Verse 22, which are all, and, and, and this is the key. <laughs> this is the foundational verse of which Shaul is dress, addressing. He is not addressing the commandments of Yah, telling them not to keep the commandments of Yah. Because the commandments of Yah are eternal. Yah's dietary laws are eternal. Yah's Shabbats are eternal. Yah's new moons are eternal. He's not addressing this. He cannot because they're eternal. So what is it that he is addressing? Again, we've, we've already pointed out that the assembly at Kalash was a Gnostic community. So let's look at verse 21. Which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. This is the center of what Shaul is addressing. It is clear he was addressing Gnosticism, the commandments and doctrines of men, and not the commandments of Yah, which are eternal. He was not telling them not to observe Yah Shabbat, his new moons and his, and his appointed days. On the contrary, he is admonishing the assembly at Kalash to not allow those devilish, wicked Gnostics to judge them for keeping Yah's commandments and subsequently convince them to accept the commandments and doctrines of men which will perish, whereby losing out on the prize. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that a very familiar scene that is still going on? If one adheres to keep the commandments of Yah, we're being labeled as religious, we're being labeled as legalists, we're being labeled as lost. But I submit to you is in, in Hazon, the 22nd chapter, a revelation of 22nd chapter. It is not those who keep the commandments of Yah who will be dismissed and kept out of the reign. But those who disobey the commandments of Yah, you can read it for yourself. Hazon verse twenty, uh, chap Hazon chapter twenty-two verse fourteen. Read it yourself. These are not my words. Read it yourself. Read the word of Yah. Read the word of Yah. So this is still today a very prevalent, familiar scene. And so I'm here to encourage someone. I'm here to encourage you, irrespective of what the lawless say to you with respect to guarding the instructions of our Abba, irrespective of what they say to you, 
Keep walking. Keep walking in the path of Zedekiah. Keep walking in the light, the Torah of Yah, and have fellowship with him and have fellowship with us. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed by their looks or what they say. If you are walking this walk, and there are very few of us who are walking this walk, keep walking this walk. And don't be discouraged by those who are lawless and who are trying to encourage you to walk in a lawless way. Verse 23, which things have indeed a show of hakma, and which things have indeed a show of hakma, which you call wisdom, and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor, to the satisfying of the flesh. So to put verse 23 into context, I will quote another passage of our father Shaul. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. That is uh, Timotheus, Beth, or 2 Timothy the third chapter, the fifth verse. In other words, he is saying the, the very people that were and are judging Elohim's people had an outward appearance of Hakma and set apartness with their religious observances, their false humility and asceticism. But they would, uh, but they were unable to restrain themselves, were and are, unable to restrain themselves from their old nature because they deny and deny the very power that could make them set apart. Again, sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? Nothing new is under the sun. There are still those judging us, Yasharal, for obeying the instructions of Yah. Because they have no understanding and because they are under a strong delusion from the whore, the great whore who was spewing spells and spewing wine all over the arrest. Because Yasharal, until you come out of her grips, until you come out of Babylon, you cannot see the way you cannot see your way clear. That's just like being up close on something and not being able to clearly see it. And not until you step back a ways, a distance, can you clearly see what it is that you're trying to focus on. And so I submit to you, Yasharal, those that are judging you because they are in the midst of Babel they can't clearly see and they can't clearly hear. And I also want to say this to you, Yasharal. Multitudes of our lost brothers and sisters are still in the midst of Babylon in these Christian churches and these Christian services. So rather than judge them, rather than become angry with them because you were once there. I was once there. Deal with them with a ruach of humility, with a ruach of patience and of understanding and of kindness and of ahaba and of compassion. Patiently dealing with them, patiently teaching them if they have ears to hear and eyes to see. Because I submit to you in accordance with Dabarim 30, that our Father is not going to gather us into the full number, unto the full number of Yasharal repents. And to the full number repents. So I submit to you, have patience. 
have patience with them and understand that this wants to, that's to this, that this too wants was you. To my brothers and sisters who are still in Babel, who are still under the strong delusion, who are still under the spell of the great whore, who are still harlot daughters of the Catholic Church, I appeal to you, I compel you to come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, and be washed and be cleansed and be invited back into the house of Yasharal and become one with the house of Yasharal, whereby becoming privy to the covenants that were given to Yasharal, to the prophet, to the promise that was given to Yasharal and to the inheritance that was given to Yasharal and to Yasharal alone. I'll end this video with uh, reading Yashiyahu, that is Isaiah, uh, the 66th chapter, the 22nd verse through the, ten, tw through the 23rd verse. And then I'm going to read Colossian, Colossians, uh, the same verses that I read previously from a better transliteration of the Hebrew scriptures, such to give you a better understanding with respect to what our father Shaul was actually saying. So Yashiyahu, the 66th chapter, verse 20 through to 23 reads, For as the new Shamayim and the new Arets or earth that I make stand before me, declares Yahuwah. So your seed and your name shall stand. And it shall be that from new moon to new moon and from Shabbat to Shabbat. All flesh, all flesh shall come to worship before me declares Yahuwah. His appointed times are eternal and they will even continue in the new reign and throughout eternity. They are eternal. Come out of these lies. Come out of these pagan churches. Come out of these pagan doctrines. Come back to Torah and gain an understanding of what our Abba is relaying to us. His Torah is his very character. It is his very nature. It gives us an insight into his mind and into the way that he sees things. It gives us an insight. It is the essence of who he is. In fact, the word declares that he is the word, that he is Turah. Turah is the word. You go back and study it for yourself. But Turah is the word. And so it gives us an insight as to who he is and to how he operates. And so he gives us these instructions so that we in turn can conduct our lives the way that he is, and so that our lives align with his, with his. Torah is light. It is light. It shines light on the dark places of our lives. It identifies what is dark in our lives. It identifies sin in our lives. Without the light of Torah, we have no way of understanding of what Yah considers set apart, what Yah considers unclean, of what Yah considers profane. And we in turn are groping around in darkness without a light 
to lead us. Without a light to lead us. Again, I'll close this video with reading Colise, Colisein, Colossian, rather, Colossians, the second chapter, the 16th verse through the 23rd verse in a better transliteration of the set apart scriptures, starting at verse 16. Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Shabbat, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of the Mashiach. Let no one deprive you of the prize. One who takes delight in false humility and worship of messengers, taking his stand on what he has not seen, puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the growth of Elohim. If then you died with Mashiach from the elementary matters of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which are all to perish with use according to the commands and teachings of men. These and these have an appearance of hakma in self-imposed worship, humiliation, and harsh treatment of the body of no value at all, only for, satisf only for satisfaction of the flesh. Only for satisfaction of the flesh. Come out of her, my people. Shalom.